From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome Inside the Ice House. For our regular listeners, my name is Amanda Hindlian, President of Fixed Income and Data Services at ICE. I will be your host for this week's episode of Inside the Ice House. Prior to joining ICE, I spent nearly two decades at Goldman Sachs, which is where I met our guest today, Gary Cohn. Gary is an American business leader, investor, and former director of the U.S. National Economic Council. He is an internationally recognized expert on the financial markets, global economy, and economic policy, and someone I have the privilege of calling a friend and mentor. Gary currently serves as Vice Chairman of IBM. Prior to that, Gary served as Director of the U.S. Economic Council and Economic Advisor to the President. Before then, Gary was President and Chief Operating Officer of Goldman Sachs. He held several other leadership positions in the firm, including Global Co-Head of the Equities and Fixed Income, Currency, and Commodities Division. He was also a member of the firm's board of directors and management committee and served as chair of the firm-wide client and business standards committee. Welcome, Gary, inside the Ice House. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure to have you today. So, Gary, I just gave an overview of your resume, but that's certainly not everything. In fact, I felt as though I skimmed the surface. So the first question for you is, of all your professional accomplishments... Which are you most proud of and why? So as you said, Amanda, I've had a really interesting career. And look, I I would say a lucky career. You know, I I, uh, graduated college typically in the early 80s and had 100% of no job offers (laughs) when I I graduated. You know, it was a tough economic time. And I took a very short-term job at uh, United States Steel in their home building products division. That's probably a little trivia answer somewhere. Lasted less than a year there. Got myself to the floor of the commodities exchange, where it's uh, sort of heartwarming to walk into an exchange building, one that still exists, where I took my first job as a runner, literally moving paper from point A to point B for, I think, $125 a week. (laughs) Um, But it it was a way into the industry. Spent time on that floor, you know, working my way up to ultimately trading my own account. And then, as you said, in the late 90s, went to Goldman Sachs, where I spent 27 years, then the White House, and then sort of running my family office, and now running my family office in IBM. So I've had a unique set of experiences. And I think. And we're going to cover those in a lot more detail. And I think each one of these experiences, there's lots to be proud of in each of them. So it's hard to talk about one in specific, but, you know, I was at. Goldman during sort of the mega growth years. I I was a partner in a private partnership. Mm -hmm. I watched the company go public in this building. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I look back at the S1, I look back at the filing papers to when Goldman went public to what the size of the company was. You know, the company's revenue and earnings for the year, they, they do in like eight to 10 weeks a year now. And you look at the size of the company and how much it grew over that tenure that we were both there. How many employees when you first started? When I first started, we were about a little bit less than 4,000. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was a small company. Mm-hmm. It, was a, it was a real partnership. And so you, you, you think about those opportunities. You think about businesses that you built you know, we're sitting here at ICE. You know, ICE was created by some ideas some, of some silly energy traders who at the time were being disintermediated by some other corporate entities. And the traders in New York said, this is kind of a silly thing for us to do. We're basically making prices and people are putting them on a screen and selling, selling them back to us. We shouldn't be in that business. We should actually capture our own market. And there was a consortium of, of 
of uh, Market Makers created. And we went in partnership with Jeff Sprecher at the time mm -hmm. and, and created ICE. So, you know, you think about that, really interesting. And at the time, it just seemed like the natural thing to do. No one could have predicted it would have left, it would have led to what, what ICE has become. I think about, you know, building a commodity index business, the GSCI, and the fact that, you know, prior to the early 90s, no one had a benchmark indice of which to measure themselves against for trading commodities. You know, the, the, in, if you go back to the late 80s, you know, people would talk about they made 80% trading commodities. Well, the, tr the truth is you could have bought one or two commodities and held them and made over 100% for the exactly. year. Exactly. Yeah, so there, there was no benchmark. Then I think about having started that index business it led us into the LME market or the base metals market, a market that I had never traded. No one at Goldman had really traded. No, one, It wasn't a big market for U.S. participants. It was really a British market. Was that Jay Aaron that was now part of Goldman, or was that prior to Jay Aaron being purchased by Goldman? This is Jay Aaron is now part of Goldman, or let, let's put it this way. We are owned 100% by Goldman. Goldman has yet to accept that there are a bunch of commodity traders sitting inside a building. I wonder why. Yeah, <laughs> that actually have a coffin tasting room on the fifth floor with spittoons and we very, still have that in our midtown office. Yes, very plebeian things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, the the important bankers of Goldman Sachs. It was hard for them to understand that. So you know, building a a big base metals trading business in the United States and being sort of the first big broker broker house there and changing the dynamics of the LME market completely. You know, we were we got into the LME market when it was all of the I would say small regional broker dealers in the UK. Mm -hmm. No one really had a balance sheet. Mm -hmm. We came in with a balance sheet and we sort of reinvented the way the market was traded. So I, I, I can go through my career and give you sort of different highlights at different moments. All of it is to say is I've had an unbelievably lucky career. I've been able to do enormous amount of different things, all of which have been fun and interesting. I've learned an enormous amount from each one. Well, it's interesting that you define it as lucky because I wouldn't say that. I would say you've brought a tremendous amount of hard work and skill to the table. But let's go back to the start. Okay. So you grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Your parents owned a local business, correct? Yes. Yes, it was a, fam a family business. Mm -hmm. my, my grandfather um, had started a family business and my dad went right from high school into the family business, yes. And it was you and your two sisters? Correct. What was the early Cone household like? Oh, I would say organized chaos. Mm -hmm. You know, we lived, as you said, we lived in, in, in Shaker Heights, which is a suburb of Cleveland. My dad, being in a family business, was out of the house by 6.30 a.m. He was not home before 7 o'clock at night, which in... Wall Street financial terms is sort of ordinary course of business. Mm -hmm. In Midwestern Ohio terms, that's really unusual mm -hmm. that your your father's not around that much. So it was really my mom and my two me and my two sisters around the house most of the time. Now your father is turning ninety this summer. My dad is turning ninety this summer. Yes. And you unfortunately lost your mom right right yes, around yes about a, a little bit over a year a, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah, a little bit after yeah. I lost mine. Yeah. I also know your grandmother was yes. a very important part of your was, upbringing, in was. addition, of course, to your parents. Yeah. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about her? Yeah. So my grandmother lived, first of all, to 106. So she just died a few years ago as well. So I've gone on a little bit of a tough stretch here. But I was not a great academic student growing up. Let's, let's uh, call it that. Well, let, let's go further. To, Gary, I was a poor student. Gary used to tell me C's get degrees. Well, I told you C's got degrees because my kids changed it. I used to say D's got degrees because in my <laughs> day and age, D's did get degrees. But my, my kids have told me D's no longer get degrees, which I don't think is fair because I was a D student. I got a degree. <laughs> so it's now C's get degrees. And I was lucky to get D's. I, I got D's because I was very good at talking to professors and making sure that you know, I could move on. I could keep matriculating through the system. I was, you know, this is I, this is not a secret to anyone. I was born pretty dyslexic, severely dyslexic. I was born in the early, early 60s, like as early as you can get in 1960. And in the early 1960s, dyslexia was not as well understood, known, um, diagnosed as it is today. 
And even now, there's still a lot to learn about dyslexia. Yeah. I was pretty. I was severely dyslexic, and it sort of affected my entire attitude towards the educational process because I was a a student suffering, couldn't really make school work. Numbers I was pretty good with. Numbers I could make work. My only risk is I would transpose a number here or transpose a number there, but mm -hmm. I could show my work so I could get like you know ninety five percent credit at least even if I transposed the number. Mm -hmm. And because I was having so much t difficulty in school, you know, kids are mean. And kids were mean before social media. They're a lot meaner today. But even before social media, kids were mean. And when you're the kid that can't pass an exam or you're the kid that's getting Ds, trying to get to the next grade with Ds, you become, you know, a little bit on the social outcast of the classroom. I'm not saying I was a social outcast, but I, I, you have to find a way to bring yourself back to the, to the, to the norm or back to the middle. So I became a little bit of the, you know, jokester. But I also can't imagine you not trying because you're such oh, no. a hard worker. So would any teacher recognize that you were trying, even though you weren't necessarily meeting their definition of the goal? So Amanda, you sort of hit an interesting nerve, not that we're going down the whole child psychology. Right? I was trying so hard. Like I would go home and I, I would spend six or eight or nine hours on work that would take someone else 10 minutes to the point where I was like literally sitting in my room crying. But it wouldn't get recognized because, like, I would turn in work that would look horrible. Right. It wasn't right. So the natural reaction is your son's not trying or your kid's not trying. And then, of course, it's the 1960s, so they give you an, they give you an IQ test because now they think, okay, maybe he's got bigger problems than dyslexia. Mm. Maybe he's just never going to learn. So then you take an IQ test and you score off the charts. And they go, oh, now it's really simple. He's just the laziest guy around. Mm -hmm. So it just, it just continued to get worse and worse and worse. Where you know teachers believed I was lazier and lazier and lazier because the more they would find out that I had you you know, weren't actually, natural intelligence, yes. but I just couldn't you know, connect two dots, um, it sort of compounded. So to protect myself, um, as a human and, and to fit in socially, which I think is important when you're a kid growing up, you find another way to fit in socially. So I became, you know, sort of the, the, the fun guy in the class. And I'm so I, shocked. I knew, I knew how to have a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I normalized my relationships and I had, had a great group of friends because, you know, okay, he's not the guy who's going to, don't ask him for homework help. Don't ask him to take his notes, to look at his notes because he doesn't have any. But if you want to go out and have a good time or you want to go do something, he's the guy you want to go with. Well, I remember you telling me once that your grandmother noticed your ability for memory yeah. recall. Right. So you, you've, got a very good, you've got a very good memory. The reason, I mean, I was close to my grandparents for many reasons, but my, the family business that my grandfather had started was an electrical contracting business. And the way electrical contracting business is you win jobs, you send electricians out to the job, and at the end of every day, around 4 o'clock, they would call into the, the office or the warehouse what materials they needed delivered to the job tomorrow. They would call them in, you'd, you'd fill the orders at night, you'd load them on the truck, and the next morning they get delivered out to the job so the guys could keep doing the work. I worked in the warehouse after school. I worked in the warehouse on weekends. I worked there summers. Um, and my grandfather used to say to everyone, you know, I could fill an order faster than anyone in the warehouse and more efficiently and better than anyone who worked there for 20 or 30 years. And there were probably you know, 2,000 or 3,000 different items in the warehouse in different places. So my grandfather said, look, Gary's the smartest guy in that warehouse. He, he knows where everything is. It, it's a huge warehouse. He knows where everything is. He knows what everything is. He knows if we don't have A, what can be substituted for A? Um, and so like, this is not a guy that can't learn, but to me, that was just a logic exercise. That was a logic exercise of someone say, Hey, and sometimes I couldn't read what was on the order. Like, Hey, what, what, what are they asking for? And they tell me, I, I go get them. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather was the one when my parents were getting very frustrated and saying, okay, you're not trying, you're lazy, you know, let's send you to military school. Uh, my grandfather said, no, you're not sending him anywhere. He's, he's, he'll be fine. It's really interesting. I thought it was your grandmother. As, well, it was really my grandfather or my grandma. It, it's hard to differentiate. They both sat in, in the office and ran the business. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the, the dyslexia element for a second, and I want to quote Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. He authored David and Goliath, 
Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants, mm-hmm. and he featured you in his work. I'm going to read you an excerpt from that book that references you specifically, and you've touched on it a little bit at the outset, but I would like you to share more with our listeners about this now infamous cab ride. Mm-hmm. So what Malcolm Gladwell wrote was, quote, most of us wouldn't have jumped in that cab because we would have worried about the potential social consequences. The Wall Street guy could have seen right through us and told everyone else on Wall Street that there's a kid out there posing as an options trader. Where would we be then? We could get tossed out of the cab. We could go home and realize that options trading is over our heads. We could show up on Monday morning and make fools of ourselves. We could get found out a week or a month later and get fired. Jumping in the cab was a disagreeable act, and most of us are inclined to be agreeable. But Cone, he was selling aluminum siding. His mother thought that he would be lucky to end up a truck driver. He had been kicked out of schools and dismissed as an idiot. And even as an adult, it took him six hours to read 22 pages because he had to work his way word by word to make sure he understood what he was reading. He had nothing to lose. There's two interesting points in there the cab ride, but also what that means that you had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. And frankly, when I think of you, I think of that as a tie into how you thought about risk management later in your career. So let's go back to the quote unquote famous cab ride. I was, as I said, I was working for United States Steel in the home building products division, which was only because my dad forced me one day to take a job. So I sort of humored him and took like a local job that I knew I would have for days or weeks. I got myself to the Long Island distributor for a couple weeks. And after, you know, I made very good friends with the guy who ran the office. And I said, look, I'm going to work really hard this week. I'm going to really work really hard next week for the first three or four days. And then you're not going to see me, but I'm going to be here, right? And he said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I came in from like Garden City on a first thing Friday morning. And I went over to what was then Four World Trade Center, that unfortunately doesn't exist today. And somehow I just thought I was going to saunter on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Like, and I'm sorry, the, the uh, New York Commodities Exchange. Um, I don't know why I thought that. I, I went to the floor of the exchange that day. I spent the entire day there. Literally, I think I've got like a 5 o'clock flight. The market closes at 2.30. It's like 2.35. And I finally get myself to the turnstile to enter the trading floor and off comes running this guy pretty well dressed you know seems rational says hey i gotta run to the airport i'll call you when i get there remind your audience pre-cell phone days Mm -hmm. um i'll call you when i get there i jump in the elevator with him and i say hey you happen to be going to LaGuardia?" shot he goes yeah i am i I go can we share a taxi goes great ran outside got a taxi in the taxi i start talking to him he tells me what he's doing I tell him what I'm doing. And it just so happens he was, you know, sort of a number three or four or five guy at one of the big brokerage houses on the floor. And that next week, they were going to start trading options on futures for the first time ever. Mm. He was chosen by that firm to go be the broker in the options pit there. So it came along that like, hey, do you know options? I go, sure, of course I do. I didn't know anything about him. He said, well, I'd love you to come in next week and, and interview. And if you can help me in the options, we're, we're happy to hire you. We got a great opportunity for you. I said, so this no problem. Was, I mean, this was sort of an act of God, right? To have this, well, your will coupled with, as you had said at the outset, a little bit of luck. Yeah. Look, clearly a little bit of luck. You know, clearly that he came walking off the floor. Clearly he let me in the cab with him. Clearly that he was starting to trade options. Clearly that he, he must was, have been very he was, tired. He was open. <laughs> and clearly that I was smart enough to agree or, or stupid enough and naively enough to agree that I could help him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, as the story goes, I, he, he flew somewhere. I forgot. I flew to Cleveland. I went to Barnes & Noble. I went, got off the plane, went to Barnes & Noble, went to the business section and started looking at options books. Luckily, I, here's another here's another luck. You dated yourself with Barnes and Noble too, I, by the way. But, by the way, I, I'm, this is all in the early '80s, so mm-hmm. there's 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 no Amazon. Believe me, Amazon. We weren't smart enough to figure that out yet. <laughs> Went to Barnes and Noble and picked up an options trading book. I happen now that I know I happen to pick up the very best one in the world, 
Options of Strategic Investment, the Macmillan book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one one of my very good friends gave me an original, original copy for my 50th birthday. So it's it's, it's framed in my (laughs) office. So I went home and started reading it. And, you know, it's like every typical book. It's three, four, five hundred pages. So I I made a strategic decision. I said, I'm going to learn four strategies. And they better work. And they better get me through the interview. So I basically read four different chapters. And I had a week. It's like I said, okay, I could take a day and memorize a strategy. Day, memorize a strategy. And the good news is there were lots of pictures in there. You know, option payouts have nice little graphs. <laughs> so pictures. Pictures are good. Pictures are really good. So I learned the four option strategies, came back in for an interview on Tuesday. So I, I met him on Friday. I came back into New York, interviewed on Tuesday. I moved to New York on Sunday and started working the next Monday. That's wild. All right, I'm going to pivot for a second to your leadership style, and I'm going to embarrass you, or at least attempt to. I wonder whether you remember the first time you and I ever met. I bet you don't. Okay, I'm going to say I don't. Okay. So here's the first time I met you. I was joining you on a flight to the West Coast to see firm clients. There were probably four to six other Goldman employees who were on the charter, And we had to take a helicopter to get to the plane because your schedule was so tight. And I was probably 26 or 27 years old. And I was terrified. I had never been on a helicopter before in my life. And you actually noticed that I was terrified and stopped all of the chaos going on around you to say, are you okay? And it wasn't lost on me as a junior employee that you took the time to not only notice amidst all of the chaos that I was clearly very nervous, but you kind of stopped everything to say, are you okay? So then I get on the plane with you and there are different folks prepping you for client meetings. You've got different regulatory issues that you've got to understand. You handed me a really dense paper on the commodities markets that no one had reviewed for you, but it was something you needed to do. And you kind of looked at me and you said, here, go tackle this. And unlike you, I love tests. And I thought, yes, I love tests. I'm going to ace this test. This is amazing. I'm going to have so much fun doing this. So I speed read the entire document. Then I went back to you and I summarized it for you. And you debated me. You didn't let me off the hook. You really hotly debated me on the flight around some of the content. But I held my own. And... You kind of smiled, you kind of looked away, and then over time you gave me more work. (laughs) (laughs) And the reason why I think that's important as a story is because it reflects one of the things that I think you really embody as a leader, which is someone who wants input, who wants guidance from others, someone who wants the feedback, who wants the ideas. You never ever made me feel that you were too powerful for me to speak the truth to you. You didn't have to agree. In fact, many times we didn't. You didn't always like what I had to say, but you always listened and you never penalized me for speaking my mind. Never. And for me, that served as a blueprint for my own leadership style. So that's my early impression and those are my words. But how do you think of yourself as a leader? So I did remember that helicopter. I wasn't sure if that was the first trip or not, but I did remember that one. You do? Do I I do remember. I remember it clearly. That I was terrified. Yes. You were, you were, you were, you were white as a ghost. And you now know my proclivity towards motion sickness. Yes, I do. Now I know. So I was motion sick as well. I, like, I knew you were were frightened. I didn't realize how frightened you were. Now that I know you well, I know how frightened you were. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, look, I, I. Thank you for all those observations. They they make me feel good. They really do. They're accurate. That, that is that is who I try. That is what I try to be. There are different leadership styles that work. I, no one should think that their leadership style is better than anyone else's because I've seen lots of different styles work. The style that I emulated at, at, at Goldman and I still try and do today is like I feel like if you go out and you hire the best people in the world they are entitled to at least be part of if or make the decision themselves. If you didn't want them to be part of the decision-making process, you shouldn't have gone out and spent money to hire the best people or, mm-hmm. or retain the best people or attract the best people. And 
that's what our special sauce was at Goldman, was mm -hmm. attracting and retaining the best people in the world. So my key was, or maybe my, even my key to success was, I'm never, ever going to make a decision. I'm going to convene groups of people, get them together, allow them to talk, and just about every time, they will come to a conclusion. And I have to live with the outcome. It may not be the conclusion I would have made, but you know what? If they get together and I convene and I sit there and I say very little and they walk out of the room agreeing, it's going to be a much better decision because they own the decision. It's not like they're going to execute my vision. Yep. And so to me, that's how you run an organization that's really where your, your greatest asset is human capital. All right. Well, we're going to take a brief break. After the break, we'll talk with Gary Cohn about his time working in D.C. and dive deeper into his views on the markets and financial crises. That's coming up right after this. And now a word from GenPact, NYSE ticker G. We are currently encountering delivery delays. GenPact is transforming supply chains using real-time data to help manufacturers keep goods flowing from the warehouse so cupboards are never bare at their house. We are in the relentless pursuit of a world that works better for people. Welcome back. Before the break, Gary and I were discussing his beginnings on Wall Street and how his upbringing has shaped his professional success. From overcoming obstacles to leadership styles, Gary has a lot of insights to share, but there's plenty more to touch on now. So Gary, one of the things I appreciate most about you is your ability to call markets from a mile away. And I'd love to, with that market acumen that you have, get a sense from you not only of where you think the economy is likely headed, the Federal Reserve from a rates perspective is likely headed, and what you think the potential market implications may be. Let me start it. Where we are now, and what I think has been so perplexing for everyone, is that everyone gets tied up in the analysis paralysis. And I think the Fed is the ultimate analysis paralysis victim right now. Well, they're data dependent. They are data dependent. But they're data dependent on their data library, which is a couple hundred years old. And they try and equate everything going on today to what has happened in the past. We are in a scenario today that they can't find in any of their data in the past. It's unprecedented. It is beyond unprecedented. And so to me, this is what's causing all the anxiety in the world. So my, my basic view right now is you've got this push-pull or, or, or going on in the economy. You've got the Federal Reserve trying to tighten financial conditions, trying to raise interest rates, trying to slow down the economy, trying to create unemployment. At the exact same time, the federal government is desperate to find ways to spend money. And they're spending money by creating projects, putting people to work, creating demand, and the Federal, the federal Reserve is going to lose. And they have been losing. They've been losing for the last year because the federal government's really good at spending money. They may not be as effective as consumers, but they also allow that multiplier effect to take effect as long as they can. Now, we'll see what happens when student loans have to start being paid. Yep. But the federal government has gone out of their way to create multiplier effects on spending, both at the personal level and at the federal level, and they're not anywhere close to done. So we are raising rates, trying to slow the economy down on one side, and we're spending money like crazy, trying to create demand for commodities, trade demand for labor, trying to create, build infrastructure on the other side. And it may just be that we end up in this okay economy for a fairly long period of time. But with high rates. With high rates. So but what do you think that means in particular for the housing market? Because that's the clearest, most direct mechanism by which rates will affect the economy. Historically, it has. We now we know that the vast majority of homeowners have mortgage rates locked in below five percent right now. You know, we were at such low rates for so long 
that you had more than ample opportunity to lock in long duration mortgage rates at four and five percent. I think it's over 75% of mortgages in the United States are 5% or less. So it does mean that trading up in houses is hard. It probably means that there's more capital investment going into existing houses mm -hmm. because you're going to stay there longer because you've got a interest rate on your mortgage that can't be replaced. Mm -hmm. It does mean that we see some more shortages of supply because for new people to build houses, it's very expensive. Construction loans are very expensive mm -hmm. and new permanent mortgages are very expensive. So we're seeing you know, this phenomenon where the supply side of the equation is not what we would like to see. But on the other hand, the demand side is tamped down by higher interest rates. So, you know, we're seeing all the variability in the multifamily space. You know. Right. But by the way, the demand side is still also being fueled by the government spending and Absolutely. consumer demand still remains robust. Yes. And and I, I, I don't see this coming to a screeching halt anytime soon. I think if you actually want to peel back the onion another layer, which sounds like you do, it feels to me that actual real-time inflation, we're in a disinflationary cycle. Mm -hmm. If you look at real-time inflation right now, we're probably below 2%. Mm -hmm. So the Fed has probably achieved what they needed to achieve. But they won't stop and, yet. I, and by the way, I'm not even sure they achieved it or the cycle has run its course. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll give them credit. Let's give the Fed credit that, that by raising interest rates, we are running at a, at a real-time spot inflation below 2%. The market has absorbed higher interest rates relatively painlessly. The consumer had enough savings and was in a good enough position coming out of COVID that the immediate impacts of higher consumer credit costs did not slow the economy mm -hmm. down. And we are now starting to see prices come back down to more rational, reasonable levels. And so... This, to me, is a bit of a muddily growing economy with full employment with higher interest rates, with consumer-driven, consumer driven because the government continues to put people to work. And wages, right? And wages, yeah. I mean, and that, that also affects the, in, the inflationary side of the mm -hmm. equation. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic. It, 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 the, the most interesting thing about the dynamic is they don't have any history. So right. when they look back, when, when the analysis paralysis people get involved, they can't find these pages in the books. And so therefore, they look at everything that looks like this, and very yield curve means X. Okay, interest rates going up means Y. This means Q. Oh, this has to happen. But they, there's another side of the equation yeah. where they, they just don't understand the other side of the equation. What do you think about fixed income markets now? I mean, they've certainly evolved rapidly, right? We've seen, I think, you know, when, when you and I were both at Goldman, we were talking about electronification in a pretty significant way, but that has rapidly sped up in the recent past. And this, this REIT environment is creating more investor demand and interest in certain parts of the fixed income market. Some of the dealers, though, have, have exited and are, are not as active in the market as they were previously. And so it's been a sort of interesting and challenging time in some respects in the fixed income markets. I wonder whether you think that trend persists. But on the other side of this equation, we've seen more managed money come into the fixed income markets. That, you mean via SMAs and ETFs and 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 even hedge funds, yep, and 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 even BD, BDCs, hedge funds, other structured vehicles. So it's no because well, the yields are there, right. and so you want the sixty forty portfolio balance again. Exactly. So you may be seeing the historic players come out with balance sheet, but the overall capital invested in the fixed income markets is actually going up. It's just going up in different places. You're just seeing new people create. Let's, let's call them more institutional retail type products mm -hmm. or quasi retail products because it's BDCs, you know, ETFs, places where there's natural demand for product. Product can be bought and held for longer duration. It's not in trading portfolios. And those businesses then can take the leverage that banks used to use for their own fixed income yep. business and they can leverage their structured portfolio. You know so the, the the business is just the, the the chairs are still there. They've just moved them around a little bit. 
Yeah, and it's interesting because actually one of the other trends you see is that as that 60-40 portfolio rebalance occurs, you're starting to see smaller trade lot sizes. Yeah. And, and that's also shaping the market in a unique way. Well, I, I resemble that remark. Uh, for the first time in my 60-plus year life, I bought a treasury bill. You did? I did. Like, did I didn't you do it? I didn't did, even know how to. How did you do it? I picked up the phone and called my broker. But and see, said, that's the problem. Yeah. You know, you got to be able to click it, click, click. No, the... I, I did. I, I agree with you. And I paid, you know, one and a half or one or two basis points for someone to do it for me, where I should be able to go direct because there's there's really no risk in buying a treasury bill. But I, I, I it was a profound moment when I said, I'm buying a treasury bill. Yeah. But, you know, you're getting – Six month yield at over you know close to five and a half percent. Why wouldn't you on on a preferred tax basis? Why wouldn't you? So I agree. Why wouldn't I? I think it's a I think it's going to be a really fascinating market to come. It sounds like you agree. No, I I, I totally agree. And, and I and you look at what's going on in in the banking market and some of the middle size and small banks withdrawing credit origination. That credit origination void is being filled. Yes, it's being filled at a higher all-in spread, Mm -hmm. a dramatically higher all-in spread. Mm -hmm. But credit is starting to become more available again. It's just expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, people have filled that void relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go there for a second. I would love to chat with you a little bit about the recent regional banking crises. And and we saw news last night with PacWest. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, sort of continues to be an ongoing theme. Back in March, you tweeted the following, quote, this is not 2008. Then every bank had a similar portfolio, mortgages, and home prices were falling. Silicon Valley Bank had a very unique balance sheet. And unlike 2008, banks today are highly capitalized and operate with significant regulations. The SVB matter is a classic run on the bank. Can you explain, I think and it would be helpful for our listeners for you to explain your view of the recent regional banking crisis in layman's terms and what precisely you think happened? Well, in layman's terms is banks were in a war for deposits. You know, and only the first two hundred fifty thousand dollars of a deposit is an insured deposit, mm-hmm. and banks were paying up to also attract uninsured deposits. And by the way, just for clarity, that's for a single account owner. It's per name, per it's basically per entity. We could play games. You, you know, you can have an account. Your husband can have an account. That's two. You and him can have a joint, joint account. account. That's, that's three. Fine. That's fine. You can have an entrust account. That's yep. four. I mean, you could you can play a lot of games to get your two fifties. But what ended up happening is, you know, deposits became really important for banks. Banks wanted to build up their their lending capabilities. We were in a very low interest rate for decades. Mm-hmm. I always remind people where we were a few years ago. We were, you know, we were having a debate not that many years ago. Will we ever have inflation again? Mm-hmm. I remember. We were in a zero interest rate environment. We were doing QE all over the world. And, and so banks were saying, look, you know, in a, in a QE zero interest rate environment, I should attract deposits and try and make spread because my spreads are small. So I need to do it on more size. Mm -hmm. Not an irrational thought. But the uninsured deposits, you know, can leave the banking system relatively quickly because when people are fearful, they don't want to lose their hard-earned deposits. They take the uninsured out very quickly. And we now have to add to that something that we all knew. In the old history of Mary Poppins, when people wanted to have a bank run, they stood outside and they had to walk to the teller's window and they had to withdraw their money or they had to send a check in and the bank could sort of slowly cash the check, slowly move them through the system. They could, you know, let three customers in the door at a time and then let three they more in the time. They could try to talk to them and they say, try please talk to don't them. But withdraw. today, you know, with, with digital banking and everyone having a cell phone, everyone can click on their deposits instantaneously in real time, move them. So you've got another, you know, really huge risk in the banking system when people can digitally move their deposits real time. And so we got to a position relatively quickly where people said, look, I have uninsured deposits at a bank. 
I can just go on my iPhone, I can go on my laptop, and I can click, and in 30 seconds, I can move them somewhere else. And you know what? If I'm wrong, I'll move them back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Better safe than sorry. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the prudent thing to do was to move your deposits. As you move your deposits, banks had those deposits invested in some interest-bearing asset because they had to pay you interest. And all of a sudden, they had to sell the interest-bearing asset they had. Unfortunately, there was no risk of that interest-bearing asset redeeming at par plus interest. But if you had to sell it before maturity, you were going to take a loss. Yep. That's the definition of a treasury bill. Yep. You know, and, and, and the banks bought exactly what their regulators told them they're supposed to buy. They bought something that's called a zero-risk-weighted asset meaning that we will charge you no capital to own this asset because there's no chance you don't get repaid in full. But if you have to sell that asset because your depositors are pulling all their money out, you will have a mark-to-market loss. In a rising rate environment, rising yes. Rising rate environment, yes. Unless you had your interest rates, but yep. we're not going to go down those rabbit holes. Well, we should. <laughs> oh, we can. We can. I mean, we can, we can go down any of these Hedging's holes. Hedging's important so, to us. So we, we saw the classic run on the bank. We saw basically people saying, I'll be prudent. I'll get my money out of the bank. And by the way, I'm going to tell everyone else I got my money out of the bank. I'm going to probably go on Twitter and tell people I got my money out of the bank because I want all my friends to know how smart I am. It's called X now. Yeah. Um, X. Oh, you're right. I'm dating myself by a day. Um, <laughs> go on X. And so therefore, you you create what's a classic run on a bank. Bank has to sell its, 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 its um, securities. And the bank has to take the market-to-market loss. The only place for the market-to-market loss to go is in the equity account of the bank. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, the the bank becomes insolvent relatively quickly. No no bank is designed to have the vast majority of its deposits leave within a 72-hour window or even a a one-week window. You know, banks have enormous data on how quickly deposits should or could leave. And banks are pretty good if 10, 20% of their deposits leave over the course of a week. But when 90% of your deposits leave in a day, there's no bank in the world that can withstand that because you would go out of business. Right. And they're accustomed to payroll cycle timing mm-hmm. and outflows that peak at certain times in the payroll cycle. I could think, think one of the key questions for you is, do you think what happened is in any way a reflection of a regulatory failure? Directly, no. I think directly there was no regulatory failure. You can't regulate for a bank run. The only way to regulate for a bank run is to make a bank a public utility. And then there would be no credit origination. Our country is completely dependent on credit origination. We use credit to drive our entire GDP. We use credit to you know, buy a house. We use credit to go to school. We use credit to consume products. We, everything we do is credit-driven in the United States. We need the credit origination machine to exist and be vibrant. The way the credit origination machine is vibrant is because banks are allowed to charge a spread on excess deposits. And if we now mandate what banks can do with excess deposits, you are going to change the cost of credit dramatically. You are going to therefore crimp the growth of the U.S. economy, you're going to change GDP relatively dramatically in the United States. So directly, there's no issue. Now, indirectly, and and I've written on this recently, because you're probably going to read from that op-ed too, recently I've written a piece where the question is, are there just so many rules and regulations in the banks that the banks can't really manage all the rules and regulations. In fact, there was a, a, a famous piece by two guys um, from the War College. They wrote a piece called Lying to Ourselves. Mm. And it talks about the military. And it talks about the military and the fact that it says, there's we, we lie to ourselves. And I'm sorry, where is the piece from? I don't so, know. It's from the War College. Okay. It talks about we lie to ourselves in the military because we have all these rules and protocols. We have so many rules and protocols that we just say, yes, we did them every day even though we know we didn't because we could never do them every day because we do nothing else. So I think in the banking world, we're a little bit lying to ourselves. We're lying to ourselves because you put so many rules and so many requirements on a bank that you're forcing banks to decide which of the rules 
they're going to enforce today or not enforce and which ones they're going to ignore till tomorrow because you can't practically do everything they have to do every moment of the day. And I think that's especially true for smaller banks. Yes, it is. So I think one of the things we should talk about as well is the response to what we saw in the recent regional banking collapse. And I'll quote you from Squawk Box instead of one of your op-eds. Okay. Um, You said, and I think this is really critical, you said the question is, have we created a new moral hazard? The moral hazard we have now is never buy a bank until it goes into receivership. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you meant? Yeah. So I, I, I think I was on with Jay Clayton, the former head of the SEC, the, you know, sort of the morning after the SVB deal. Well, I was on the I night of the was S- I was on the FRC. night of the SVB deal, or, I was, I, or the next day, or whatever. So what I, what I'm saying is, if you buy a bank the day before they have gone to receivership, and they were trying to sell SVB, and they were trying to sell many other banks prior to the inevitability of a FDIC takeover you would assume lots of liabilities. You would have to assume the whole balance sheet. You'd have to fund the whole balance sheet. You'd have to put up equity. You'd have to do all the normal things you would do in a normal bank-to-bank merger transaction. What has happened is if you wait for the bank to go into an FDIC-generated auction, the FDIC feels pressure to get these banks sold very quickly. They have been very agreeable to providing enormous amount of incentives to take the troubled bank off their balance sheet, Mm -hmm. including guaranteeing loan performance, including lending you money, including giving you waivers on capital adequacy or capital charges. Purchasing back loans. Purchasing back Purchasing back bad loans, being able to reject loans back. Mm -hmm. So no matter how badly you want a bank, you're still better off to wait for it to go into receivership and then put a bid in for it and see what you can get as in addition to just buying it. So I think we have created a moral hazard because to the extent that I really wanted or someone really wanted to buy a bank, they would they would still wait for it to go in, into the receivership public auction. I agree. I also think it's really fascinating for all of the work that we did together over the mm-hmm. years and trying to address the issue of too big to fail. We've gone and run in the opposite direction. Well, and, and, and remember, in Too Big to Fail, it was the big banks could never get bigger again. But That's of course, right. when they really need one of the big banks to buy someone, they're going to allow it to happen. That's right. So we, we've seen all these things turned on their head. And you know, it, it, it sort of proves to me that you can regulate to death. You can't foresee everything that's going to happen. And you're going to have to be adaptive. To me, we, it would make more sense to get back to good, sound, fundamental banking regulation. Regulate the 10 things that really matter mm-hmm. and stop forcing banks to spend literally millions of, of, of people hours and billions of dollars on things that may not matter. But the regulators just feel like, okay, we're going to do it just because we want to put more and more restrictions on it. So I'm going to pivot to Washington for a bit. You know, after your time on Wall Street, and as I mentioned at the outset of the podcast, you served the country as director of the National Economic Council. What are you most proud of accomplishing while you were in D.C.? Well, I think there's two things that I look back on D.C. So, you know, going in, we as a team set a economic agenda. And it was a pro-growth, pro-business, pro-U.S. agenda. And I think we had executed that pretty well. You know, we, we, we had come out of an environment in the prior administrations where getting GDP over 2% was, was not able to be done. Mm-hmm. And there was always this discussion, are we ever going to have interest, are we ever going to have inflation? Are we ever going to have interest rates over o- over zero? And are we ever going to be able to grow GDP over 2%? We got to an environment where we basically had 3% GDP growth. We had 3% wage growth and we had um, 3% unemployment. And, and so when you look at those factors, we created, we felt like we created a friendly environment where everyone won. Companies won, employees won, consumers won, our global competitive position won. And the data was pretty compelling. 
we were picking up more and more wealth and more and more wages in the bottom third of the income producers in the United States than Mm -hmm. the top. The top Mm -hmm. was losing wages, the bottom were gaining wages. We had done a lot of things to try and sort of make the economy as fair as we could make it. Now, look, we were, we were, pro-smart regulation. We weren't deregulators per se, but we were pro-smart regulation. But on the other hand, we were we were in favor of mergers that made sense. We didn't have an adversity to bigger is better. Uh, that said, some mergers were turned down during the period we were in the, in the White House. And we just tried to run a, a economy that made sense. So that's on the big picture. On the specific policy, you know, one of the big reasons I went to Washington was tax reform. Yep. And, you know, it is something that hadn't been done for over three decades in the United States. And I felt like we needed a major overhaul of our tax system. I recall at the time that being a key decision for you in, in, in leaving Wall Street to go to D.C. I think it was probably the 90 percent factor. Yeah. Is that I felt like I had a shot to really do something seismic in tax reform. Um, and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you what was motivating me. What was motivating me is it sort of pained me as a advisor to our corporate clients to walk into a boardroom and say, hey, I've got a really amazing idea for you. You don't need to do anything different and I can raise, raise your EPS and your ROE significantly. And they look at you like, you're the stupidest person I've ever seen. I go, no, no, I can do this for you. And they go, it, it, it's impossible. If you can do it, we'll do it. I said, okay, you need to read domicile to Ireland. We're just, we're just going to move your corporate headquarters. We're going to take you to a different tax jurisdiction and invert you out of the United States, and you'll save you know, the, the difference in tax spread. And by the way, you do nothing else different. Mm-hmm. You, know, you move your corporate headquarters. You have your four board meetings a year over there, and, and that's all you have to do. And I would go make that pitch, and I would come out of there and go, I can't believe I just did that. I don't feel good about myself. No, I don't feel good at all. I'm, <laughs> like, I'm a, I'm a, I love America. Yeah. Like, how, how can this be? Oh, and by the way, you know, if you, if you leave your money offshore, you never pay U.S. taxes. You do, there are so many loopholes in there that were just the wrong motivation. So I, I was highly motivated to fix a bunch of these fundamental problems in the system. And... Literally from the day I accepted the job, I started working on tax reform with a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. The good news is there were a bunch of like-minded people in the House and the Senate and the administration. We didn't all agree initially on what the optimal plan was, but we got there relatively quickly. And over the course of a year, we executed what I still think today and it'll be interesting as, as history goes on. I think we executed a really interesting pro-U.S., pro-growth um, tax plan. What surprised you most about Washington? I think the quality of the people in the government. You know, you leave a place like Goldman Sachs and you're, you're surrounded by the most talented people in the world. You, you get into, you know, like the House Ways and Means Committee and we're sitting there in a room, it's two o'clock in the morning, we say, hey, we want it so X, Y, Z happens. And you know, some woman who's been on the House Ways and Means staff for 20 years go, says, go to page 2018, paragraph six, and change those three words. I go, really? She goes, yeah. Then you can do what you want. That, that will allow it to happen. I mean, people in Washington that work in these committees and know these laws, they know these laws, and they've worked there. And it is their life. And, it, and they're really good. And we're lucky to have them. We're really lucky to have them. So after you left DC, you actually found yourself in in the tech sphere. So now as vice chairman of IBM, I've had this conversation with you before, so I'm curious to see what your answer is, but where do you spend most of your time? So I spend quite a bit of time with IBM. I spend quite the other part of my time on my family office, which is I would say a, a venture tech-y, tech-ish, um, portfolio mm-hmm. and just managing my portfolio. So it's I would say it's about 50-50 at this point. Are you engaged on the IBM side and some of the dialogue on AI? Completely engaged. What do you think? So I'm, I'm spending a lot of time in Washington with the regulatory environment. I'm spending a lot of time helping IBM think about, you know, what smart regulation looks like in AI. And I think that there's really interesting opportunities in AI 
I'm not in the doom and gloom AI camp. Mm -hmm. I'm in the very positive, very pro AI. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I think that there, there does have to be some guardrails around what AI is used for, where it gets its data, how you test your models. And how you train your models. And how you train your models. So I, I, I think it's got to be, it, it, it's got to be, you know, something that's confined. I, I don't want, I don't want to be prescriptive, but I think it's a, it's sort of a business that needs guardrails about around it. But it's not entirely new, right? I mean, we've seen, we've certainly seen an acceleration. So, from an IBM perspective, AI was first used in 1959. Mm. So IBM has been in the AI business since 1959. Um, I, I always remind people that Watson won a Jeopardy in 2011. It beat Kasparov in chess in 2012. I remember that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that was Watson playing Jeopardy. That, so that was in itself 12 years ago. Now that AI is different than the AI today. Yeah. But that was a foundation to build on where we are today. So this idea of AI and machine learning has been in progress for decades. You know, IBM just announced a huge new library of software products, Watson X, three years in the making. You know, it's, it, it's been a long period of time to how you get to these AI models. Well, in the data business here, it's quite similar. You know, we've leveraged AI for ever, yeah. um, you know, as long back as, as legacy interactive data corporation. It's just the question now becomes, how do we think about generative AI? How do we think about LLMs in practice? Right. And how do we ensure the safety and integrity of information too, which I think is another important element of the dialogue. I agree with that. No, look, the, the, the reason we're all sitting here talking about AI today is because we've had two big retail products come out, whether it be BART or, or ChatGPT. ChatGPT, yeah. You know, until we had BART or ChatGPT, we all sort of knew there was some AI going on in the back. You know, when, when, when you put in driving directions and it says their best route is this, your alternate route this, and it keeps changing. You know, that's not a person in the back. No. There's a machine. There's a machine changing your directions. That's all AI. That's all, that's all, you know, machine data. So we've been using AI, whether we knew it or not. We've all been calling call centers, as frustrating as some of them are. Some are much better than others. So it's been in our lives. The reason it's become this big topic in Washington is because of these large language models, because of the chat GBTs, because of the BARDs making it a very retail product. And the fear, and by the way, the justifiable fear of you know, where's the data coming from? Is the data biased? What are the copyright implications? You know, what does this have to do with educational processes? Are kids writing the papers? So these are all legitimate questions. But there's an argument that actually you have to be better and smarter because if the machine can produce the basis, then you better be able to produce a lot more. On well, and then the machine can catch that the machine did it. Exactly. Right? So, like, the, my, my kids graduated from college a few years ago, but even years ago, the, their papers were being run through machines to see if they were plagiarizing mm -hmm, anymore. Mm -hmm. And they've been out of school for five to ten years. Mm -hmm. So, like, this idea of the machine can catch the machine, it's been around for a while. Uh, on the flip side, which I don't think we talk enough about, is, you know, in my career for sure, you know, I've lived through these potential big growth GDP enhancing changes. And if you go back to like the, the, the Alan Greenspans of the world and talk about, you know, what do we need? We need more productivity in the United States. And the only way to grow the economy is productivity. So, you know, we go back to the personal computer, the PC. That was a great leg up in personal productivity. Yep. And then, you know, the internet clearly helped pr personal productivity. And then the smartphone. So when we got each and, each and every one of those, there again was a little bit of an initial thought, oh my God, what's going to happen to people that write memos and print memos and deliver mail inside an office building? Those jobs are going to be eliminated. Well, those jobs were eliminated. But I don't know of a company today that is smaller because of the internet or because of a personal computer or because of a smartphone. Every company I know is dramatically bigger over the last decade. No, it just required people to retool their own skill sets. It, it did. But in a, in, a, in a much more fulfilling way, in a 
a higher job satisfaction way, in a more productive way, and it allowed companies to get bigger and broader, cover more clients, cover more geography, offer more products. Because they could take the existing headcount and instead of you know, data inputting data all day long, they could start analyzing the data. They mm-hmm. could understand what products we should sell, mm-hmm. what products we shouldn't sell, how, how, to, how to market products, how not to market products. It, it made companies smarter based on the same amount of headcount, made the headcount more valuable, made the margins higher. It allowed people to get paid more. This is, and this do is what, more interesting work. Right. This is what productivity grows all about. Yep, I agree. All right. Um, we're going to wrap here. Are there any questions that we didn't ask? Any final points you want to make to our listeners? No, I think I think you've gone around the world and you've gone around the life of Gary Cohn pretty well. Okay. Well, thanks, Gary, for joining us inside the Ice House. We look forward to seeing all of the many things you will accomplish next. Thank you for having me. That's our conversation for this week. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at icehouse podcast. Our show is produced by Isabella Bazone with production assistance from Pete Ash. I'm Josh King, your host. Signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 